Hello there, everybody. So today's lesson is about the poem by Dylan Thomas called Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Long title, but you'll see why that is the name of the poem here in a second. So it, Thomas was a Welsh poet and uh, supposedly the poem is based off of his own father. So keep that in mind as you read this. So now I want y'all to take a minute, read it, and I want you to continue annotating. And for this poem, I want your annotations to focus on the symbols you find, uh, the tone of the poem, and how each of those and the, the repetition of certain words or ideas uh, contribute to the themes. So you're going to want to identify the theme and then see how these different parts of symbols and tone and repetition help you identify that theme. How do those contribute to that theme in the poem as a whole? So I want y'all to take a few minutes, read this, read the poem, and uh, mark, mark down your ideas. So y'all should have taken care of your annotations, looked for your own ideas, you know, what symbols, what do you think those symbols mean? What do they represent? So starting off with our smile method, we're looking at the structure of the poem. So the structure is pretty consistent, you know, because I have my text enlarged, um, the, the, continuation of a line is going to be indented. So this is a, these stanzas are all three lines. These are just longer lines. So they got dropped down to an extra one. But each stanza is three lines, except this last one, it has four and ends with a rhyming couplet. And a rhyming couplet is just when two lines next to each other rhyme perfectly. Um, but it's got six stanzas and it follows a pretty consistent pattern each stanza goes a b a a b a and and it's not even the the words are um different each each line rhymes in the same pattern as the stanza previously so it follows that ABA pattern all the way. And your last stanza follows A, B, A, A. And what that means is the end of each line. This will be a little bit easier to imagine it. So night, light, right, night, bright, light, flight, night. That pattern, each of those words rhyme. You know, height, night, light. Those things all rhyme together. Same thing, this this middle line, day, they, bay, way. Each of these middle lines, that B in the rhyme scheme representation, each of those rhymes perfectly. And that's pretty impressive when you think about it, because when people rhyme in the English language, sometimes it's a little difficult or the rhymes will be, you know, not quite perfect in that because there's only so many words to convey certain ideas in the English language. So it's pretty cool that he managed to have each line rhyme perfectly. The sounds are exactly the same at the end of these lines. Um, and in doing so, in limiting his word options, in limiting the possibilities of the way he could have written this, it kind of gives you this idea of a focused, obsessive, emotional speaker. And the poem itself is pretty emotional. He's talking about 
old age and dying and, and people at the end of their life and how they should handle facing that death. You know, he says, and that's that kind of goes into our next one, meaning. He says, don't go quietly to death. Be passionate at the end. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. He's saying death is inevitable. It's going to happen. But how are you going to do it? Is it going to be on your terms? You shouldn't go quietly. You shouldn't just accept it. You should go down fighting. So the themes that you see in the poem would be that defiance of death going on your own terms. It's inevitable, but you don't have to go down without a fight. He's also talking about family and old age and grief. You know, you find out at the very end, he's addressing his father. You know, the rest of the poem sounds like he could be, he could be talking to anybody about death and despair and, you know, these really sad topics. He could be saying that everyone knows when their end is coming, but they don't want to go because of these reasons. Good men see their life at the end, but they talk about how, you know, they haven't done anything worthwhile. They're not ready to go because they haven't done enough. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. He's saying that these, these men who are close to death, they're solemn, they're serious. They can see the brilliance of their life. They, they can see the, you know, the brilliance and the joy, because that's what this means here. You know, this poem was written in the 50s. Words, the, the evolution of words and meaning and intention has changed a little. We can all kind of relate to this idea of coming to the end with dignity, you know, and not even necessarily with death, but facing life with dignity, facing each day with intention. But despite that message, that universal message, something that could apply to everybody in five of these six stanzas, your sixth stanza, the very last one, it changes everything because he says, and you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Suddenly going from general statements, you know, going from giving advice or, you know, stating how he believes death in the end should be handled, it turns into a plea. It turns into a kind of desperation. He's not ready for his father to go. He's telling his father, go out with all the passion of life. You know, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears. Don't go quietly. I still want to hear from you. So with that, we move on to the letter I for imagery. These middle lines is where you really see it because actions are being compared to natural things. You know, old age should burn and rave at the close of day. You know, it makes you think of a, a fire, something harsh and, you know, fast moving and, and violent, burn and rave. The next stanza, their words had forked no lightning. So comparing their words to a lightning strike, their words had no lasting impact. They were fleeting. They didn't change the world the way that they wanted to because wise men, you expect them to have this epiphany. You expect them to have this, this idea that somehow manages to change the world, but he's comparing it to forked lightning. It didn't change anything. It was there and then it was gone. 
you know, next stanza, their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay, saying that, you know, they didn't do anything that really lasted. You know, they're talking about, you know, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. So they're saying they're, they're focusing on what they could have done, what they didn't manage to accomplish. You know, they did these things, you know, what, what might have been the outcome, you know, talking about here in the fifth stanzas, how meteors are symbolizing this brilliance and joy and talking about the blinding light. You know, if you've ever talked about meteors in science class or seen a shooting star, you know that they're there and they're gone really quick. If you blink, you miss it. So what he's saying here is that that joy, that brilliance, that light of life comes and goes quickly. Okay. You know, the next thing that he uses a lot is, you know, that symbol of comparing light to, to life. You know, a lot of the lines end with night or light. You know, you, you see those two words a lot because he's comparing night, you know, the close of day, dying of the light. He's comparing the darkness to death and the light, you know, forked lightning, bright, frail deeds. Talking about the sun here. He's using these two ideas to represent life and death. So under L for language, you're going to also see his his pun. He he makes a pun. He's playing on the double meaning of the word grave here. Grave means two different things in this context. One is you know, serious men, solemn men, you know, grave means to be serious. But he's also playing on the fact that they're near death. So these serious men are also near their grave. So he's playing on the the two meanings of the words here by using a pun to continue to emphasize that closeness with with death and being near the end of their life. He also uses alliteration in the refrain because we see that he repeats, do not go gentle into that good night and rage, rage against the dying of the light. Each of these stanzas ends with one of those two lines and your the last stanza ends with both of them. So the, the alliteration here is in two different two different letters it's the hard g so the the g in go and good it's that hard sound and by using that harsh sound he's connecting the metaphor of night to death do not go gentle into that good night the G in gentle does not count as part of that alliteration because it's making a different sound. You have G for go and J for gentle. So the alliteration is in go and good and also not and night. Okay, so repeating those sounds and continuing that line through the rest of the poem He's just continuing that idea of, you know, night means death. Do not go quietly to your death. And it's kind of ironic that he's calling it a good night. It's, you know, referring to it as uh, a good night or good death because his whole poem is about how that's not good, how, how 
de- he ha- he does not have a positive opinion when it comes to dying. He also repeats, uh, uses alliteration in this line, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. You know, near death, who with blinding sight. He's repeating that B sound and using the alliteration, it kind of focuses on that contradiction in this, in this line, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Blind eyes aren't normally described as being bright, as blazing. They're usually described as dim, lightless. So here he's saying by contrasting those two ideas, those two images, he's saying that these eyes are lighting up with the realization about their life and what joy it was now that they're close to death. They couldn't see this light. They couldn't see this joy until it's about to be taken from them. So what other comparisons do you see in this poem? He uses metaphor a few times. I want you to to also look through and tell me, I want you to find two. Tell me two different examples of metaphor or simile and what he's comparing and why that comparison is useful, okay? What what makes his use of that metaphor powerful? What does that metaphor add to the poem's theme? How does that metaphor let you know that he's focusing on grief over death, that he's focusing on that theme of defiance. What, what comparisons does he make that lets you know that's the message he's trying to get across here? Because he doesn't sound really angry. You know, reading the poem, you're kind of sad because it is talking about death, but it's also encouraging, you know, talking about Eve, you know, our last point in our smile method emotion. The mood of the poem is almost sad because of course, you know, death is a sad topic, but it's also encouraging you to live a full life, leave an impact, leave with no regrets, you know, leave without worrying that, you know, frail deeds could have done more. His, his tone as the speaker, he is passionate. Initially, when I read through this, I thought he'd be angry because, you know, at the end, he's pleading with his father, you know, don't, don't die. Don't, don't go out quietly like this. Can rage against your death. Be passionate. But the poet isn't really angry. The entire you know, the entire course of the poem, you get passion, you get force behind his words. He talks about the different types of men and the different things that they see coming up on the end of his uh, end of their lives. But he's not angry. He's not critical. It's just at the end, he, it, it sounds pleading. You know, calling his tone angry isn't quite right. So the here in this poem, the tone and the mood are going to be two slightly different things. Because remember, tone is about how the poet sounds, how the poet's voice comes across. Mood is how you as the reader feels. What, what does reading their words make you feel? 